Welcome to everyone. I hope you have a great time. This will be the fourth webinar of the ISG. Um, this time we talk about posterior uveitis. Um, I think we will follow the same schedule, the same timing more or less as we did for the first three uh, webinars. Um, you see that you can ask those questions, Q and A. Please only use this part for your questions, not the chat. We won't ask chat questions. This is really only for us to communicate, but um, we try to really answer all the questions if possible, even if you have to extend the program a little bit longer. CME and documents, you know that you only can get the CME points when you are listening live. After that uh, webinar, you directly will get this form to fill out evaluation form for us to give some direction how it was, uh, where the problems are for us. And then you, if you send that back, you will get your CME points. If you have to miss this or also the other uh, webinars, again, you go to our website to the same part where you register for the next one, hopefully, and then you go down, scroll down, and there you will find all the videos of the previous uh, webinars. Okay, so I wish you all a very nice webinar. And I think we will start with Mark Desmet uh, about anatomical types of uveitis and associated disorders. Mark? Okay, so let me share my screen if I'm allowed to. Please. May the host give me access. Thank you. So this is the introductory talk to today's topic. We're talking about posterior uveitis and we're going to talk about its anatomic locations and about the pathophysiology that subtends this. So, um, if we're looking at the IUSG classification of uh, where inflammation can occur, uh, we've already talked in the past about anterior uveitis, so it involves the anterior chamber. And it may on occasion give some cells that appear in the anterior vitreous, but it shouldn't really go much beyond that. If we have involvement of the vitreous humor, so the, the vitreous cavity in any part, whether it's in the back or in the front, we talk essentially about intermediate uveitis. Beyond that, um, and this intermediate uveitis may also involve uh, some elements of the retina. For example, you may see a little bit of vasculitis associated with intermediate uveitis or involvement of the pars plana. And if the involvement is largely pars planal and involving the retina, um, then we'll talk about more pars planitis. And I'll show you an example a little bit later. Now, if we have involvement of the retina, we're going to talk mainly about posterior uveitis. This could also involve some elements of the vitreous, the deeper vitreous overlying the retina itself. It may also involve the choroid or maybe even exclusively the choroid, the choriocapillaris and the deeper retina that would still be considered uh, posterior uveitis. And if on the other hand, and we could involve the optic nerve, and if, on the other hand, we have involvement of all layers, including the anterior chamber, then we're going to talk about mainly panuveitis. So this is largely an anatomic uh, description and localization of uh, inflammation. And it's a good way to start, but it certainly is not where we should end. Now, this is the example I was talking to you about of a case of, uh, of, of uh, pars planitis where you can see on this image below uh, this line, which is essentially vitreous condensates that are present very close to this, the uh, pars plana, as well as all these condensate inside the vitreous, which are vitreous floaters. And this is often what these people complain about with very little other involvement in the retina. I'll let my other colleagues discuss a little bit more about that because they'll be discussing the differential diagnoses of uh, retinal conditions. <clears throat> What I'd like to spend a little bit of time before we go further is about things that you probably already know a fair amount about, and this is anatomy. And uh, you know that the retina, the macula, is a special area that has no vascularization. It has a special structure, which is in particular shown in the images down uh, on the left. And in particular, and we'll come back to that in my last talk with regards to the structure of the macula itself, 
because this has importance when we start looking at to where edema can develop. So retina has a special uh, characteristic. It has tight junctions inside its retinal vessels. It is uh, part of the brain behind the blood ocular barrier. The choroid is part of the general circulation. And if we look at this circulation, some of it appears very clearly on the retina. There's a barrier due to the RPE if we're going to do fluorescein. And the choroidal circulation is characterized by about 10 to 15 choroidal drainage points uh, to the uh, back outside of the eye. If we do fluorescein, it's going to be able to get through the vasculature of the retina. But interesting also at the level of the choroid is initially it's going to essentially diffuse throughout the choroidal space. But depending on the entry points, maybe there may be some delay. And as the time passes, the drainage, the uh, compound, the fluorescein may stay in the interstitium of the uh, choroid, but it should in fact leave the vessels uh, more or less free of uh, compound, which means that we're able to see them essentially lined out against the um, um, background of the choroid. Why is this important? Because many of the diseases we'll discuss have uh, a vascular component and understanding where you may be looking, whether it's inside the retina or within the choroid, is important in trying to understand the pathophysiology that goes on. Obviously, we wouldn't expect leakage from the uh, retinal vessels. This is, in fact, an animal model. And I use it in part to introduce the fact that we can modelize a lot of what is happening inside the retina and choroid by using specific antigens that are able to cause inflammation. Now, if we see leakage from the retina, it's good to remember a, a, a few things. The normal vessels don't a, a allow fluid to come through. If it does, there's a high protein content in cells. So in many ways, it's an exudate that comes through these areas. And after repair has occurred, very often the retina will recover, the vasculature will recover. But if they're sheathing, it will either light up because of autofluorescence or because there is some damage that allows low protein content to come out um, and, uh, and does show up on fluorescein at a later time. Now we'll talk a little bit about ICG also. ICG is very interesting. Again, it's a compound that in theory can get out of the vessels, but because it's protein bound, tends to stay within them. So in the very early uh, frames, you'll be able to see Haller's layer. Later on, you'll be able to see the uh, Sattler layer and the choriocapillaris, and this shows up in this image in the upper right. And depending on the pathology that is present, um, you may get more leakage from vessels also in the choroid that will blur everything, which is a characteristic of certain forms of uveitis. Also, we'll talk about the fact that you can have uh, um, granulomas. Granulomas in the retina are relatively rare, although you can certainly see them, particularly with ICG or OCT in the choroid itself. And so, for example, here we have a case that shows you some of these granulomas that are present inside the uh, choroid. And notice also that the vasculature that we were able to see in the previous images are very indistinct here because there's been leakage outside of the choroidal vessels from ICG. So we've talked about ocular barriers. We have inner blood retinal barriers that give us tight junctions. The parasite and astrocytes prevent the fluid from coming out. And there's also a role being played by retinal mirror cells as they form a, um, a neuroglial type of, uh, of uh, complex that uh, tries to keep the fluid inside the, the vessels and at the same time extrude ves uh, fluid from the choroid. The outer barrier is equally important, particularly the RPE, since it pumps fluid out. It also has tight junctions. And so in inflammation, all of these can start to leak and uh, cause um, visible changes on angiography, but also edema in the retina. Now, the eye has immune privilege, tissue barriers, which we've talked about now. There are no true lymphatics in the retina, although there are some lymphatics that have been now observed within the choroid. That's part of the reason why you can form some small granulomas there that are early signs or early formation of pseudo uh, lymph nodes. Immune privilege is present. You don't express class one very much, and you have absence of class two within the retina. You have half fast ligand, which essentially means that you induce inflammatory cells to go in apoptosis. 
And there's high TGF beta, uh, uh, VIP protein, as well as somatostatin that all downregulate the inflammation that is present inside the retina and the eye. But of course, this is not absolute. We do have situations where uh, expression or inflammation can occur. And this depends on the presence of antigen presenting cells. And these are microglia and macrophages, which are inherently present within the retina. The microglia originate in the retina. The, um, the um, 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 macrophages come in. They're usually called in if there's inflammation present. And there are two phenomena that are, I think, very important for us to understand is that these microglia and macrophages usually sit in the upper retina. <clears throat> As they become activated because antigen presentation has occurred, they become globular in form and they will migrate progressively down to the uh, RPE level, trans uh, migrate through the RPE and get into the general circulation where they can either activate or inactivate any inflammation in the retina. As we age, we accumulate more and more of these uh, activated cells and they don't migrate through the retina as well which may be one of the reasons why, as we get older, there is more and more risk of us developing certain forms of inflammation. Now, activation, either microbes or otherwise we have some endogenous peptides that are present within the uh, retina in particular that get presented by these microglial cells and these macrophages. These will cause a localized activation that may recruit more leukocytes and inflammatory factors in, from the blood vessels to, to get into the tissue. And these will either lead to elimination of the microbe or the pathogenic process and to repair, or otherwise, if it's a chronic uh, phenomena, it ends up leading to inflammation, damaging inflammation. So a little bit of inflammation inside the eye is not necessarily a bad thing because para-inflammation is the way the body repairs itself. And this becomes more important as we, be, uh, as we get older. There are certain forms of very mild sarcoidosis we can see in the LOD population. And just a, sim a very simple control of this will lead to stabilization. While pathologic inflammation is the one that leads to damage. And in fact, our major role with most of the uveitis we, uh, we deal with is to try and prevent this tissue injury that leads to permanent damage. Now, if we look at the way in which inflammation occurs, there are different uh, um, time periods. If we find that uh, there is an acute event that leads to a very severe inflammation inside the eye, this is usually activation of the innate immunity, very often due to the presence of an infection. There's a pathogen there that is causing it. If we have a cellular process, this is going to take much longer to occur. If, it has, if it's a memory process that is being reactivated, it can occur within two to four days. If on the other hand, it's a process that hasn't been seen before, it will take much longer. It may take up to a month. And this is a little bit what you see, for example, if we're dealing with sympathetic ophthalmia. Exposure is often a month or more before. And in VKH, we also have a window at the very beginning where we start seeing a process, but if we deal with it very actively and aggressively, we can stop the inflammation because this is a cellular process which hasn't completely established itself. More chronic disease goes usually from a T-cell mediated process to one that is B-cell mediated. And this brings on uh, something that I'll come to just in a minute is that I like to classify the disease in terms of the processes going on. Now, I've already mentioned that as inflammation develops in the eye, we are going to start thinking about etiology. And if it's very acute, you should think about infections. And uh, there are many, there can be a bacterial infection that comes into the eye, but the ones that we commonly see in, in posterior pole would in involve the, uh, uh, the, uh, some viruses, uh, particularly uh, varicella type vi viruses. Syphilis, of course, can occur. Tuberculosis is quite common in many parts of the world, as is toxoplasmosis. And other things today, luckily, are becoming a little bit less uh, prominent. Of course, one of the major things we're interested in is with regards to non-infectious causes. And here, the important thing you have to start thinking about is are there associated systemic diseases? So the symptomatology of the patient becomes important since if we're going, if it is, has a systemic component, very often treating that will largely help the ocular condition. 
or is it purely ocular uh, condition that we're dealing with? And if something doesn't seem to fit, in other words, the vision is too good, there's a lot of inflammation present, you should think about other things, masquerades, this could be lymphomas, it could be past trauma, it could be due to drugs that the person is getting to either uh, treat his cancer or other diseases inside the eye. I've mentioned that I like to classify responses. To me, antibodies are important. Antibody complexes lead to vasculitis or potentially to occlusion. And uh, many of you have heard about, for example, brolocizumab that is being used for uh, AMD. And there is an associated vasculitis that has been described, but it has also been seen with other antibodies being injected into the eye. T cells, when they become activated, I showed you the leakage that was present in the vasculature in an experimental model can give you vasculitis, retinitis, choroiditis. And if it's a retinal antigen, it tends to affect more the retina. This is what we see in part with birdshot um, and in, in certainly models that involve, for example, uh, retinal specific antigens. If melanin driven, you'll see a lot more choroidal involvement. That's what we see with sympathetic and we see with VKH. B cells, when we look at biopsies that were done over the years, tend to be associated with more chronic or long-standing uveitis, very often associated with the fibrotic process. And so then the type of therapy you want to use, particularly when you see that, will aim more towards the B cells. And finally, of course, macrophages are important because those are typical of a granulomatous response. And we do see that in the posterior pole. I've shown you already an example. They're usually associated with antigen sequestration and if you can uh, uh, reduce the presentation that they cause, you can in fact reduce the degree of inflammation present, unless of course, what you're looking at is related to an infection, for example, TB, when you do have to treat that uh, process. As an introduction to the other people that are following me, let's talk about how you develop a differential diagnosis with posterior disease. We've talked about location at the beginning, I've mentioned about active versus chronic disease. We've just mentioned granulomatous versus non-granulomatous. What we didn't talk very much about was about demographics. Where, uh, um, where's the patient from? Because depending on your part of the world, there will be more likelihood of you having certain forms of uh, uveitis than others. You want to know their origin. There's a lot of uh, motion throughout the world. And so sometimes I see patients that come from South Africa, for example, uh, or sorry, South America, and I have to think about a different differential. The sex, some diseases are more frequent in males than in females, age, and of course, personal habits. Associated symptoms and signs. And what is also very important is how well did the patient respond to any therapy that they received in the past. So we've talked about intermediate, posterior, and panuveitis. And what you'll see here is that for intermediate, we can have separated between infectious systemic disease and no systemic disease. And I'll encourage you to come back to this talk later and have a look at this, uh, at this uh, uh, chart. Syphilis, you'll see, is in all of the infectious causes. Lyme disease is more intermediate. Posterior is associated with viral diseases. And uh, if we look at the panuveitis, and uh, posterior disease could also be tuberculosis, panuveitis causes other forms of uh, associations. For systemic disease, a lot is based on sarcoid or very specific types of presentations that are syndromatic. So for example, Bechet's VKH. And, um, and then for the ones that don't have any systemic association, these are the ones that you should really try to recognize because there won't be much other symptoms except the ocular ones. And you'll be hearing more about this in a few minutes. You can also classify based on age. There are certain diseases that are more common as you get older, sorry. If we look at, for example, go from 45 and older and less, bird shorts or pigeoness, ampi, these are diseases that are very specific to the eye. Bechet's tends to occur from about 20 uh, years older. And the 25 to 45 the, uh, age range, we find again, um, some of these intermediate uveitis, VKH tends to occur around now as many of the white dot syndromes or toxoplasmosis. Parsphonitis is more a disease of the teenage years and older. 
uh, sarcoid can start sometimes in these uh, age groups. And of course, trauma is a common thing. And sometimes trauma, the entry point is so small that it is uh, uh, not really visible, except maybe for a small transillumination inside the iris. And it can cause an inflammation that will only be dealt with by removing the offending, uh, uh, often iron particle that is present uh, in the eye. With regards to youth, it has it associated with other diseases that will be dealt with at another time. Laterality, um, unilateral poster uveitis, um, at least when it presents actively inside the eye, sarcoid very often, Bechet's disease, intraocular foreign bodies, as we've mentioned, and parasitic disease will tend to be unilateral as some of the acute retinal necrosis, though if left alone, this may become bilateral as it was in its initial description. Symptomatology also can or, uh, uh, orient you in certain ways. Headaches are associated with sarcoidosis and VKH, deafness, but particularly with VKH and uh, sympathetic. Uh, weakness of paresthesias can be seen in MS in particular and to some extent with Bechet's and you can see the whole listing that is presented here. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to simplify things. You should think about duration and demographics in your patient. What is the antecedent response or is this an acute event? Look for location, laterality, and the le lesion types that are present. And of course, think about signs and symptoms. And uh, this sort of simplifies itself to an acronym DAOs. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Mark. Michali? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mark, for the wonderful talk and simplifying it. Now going to the clinical aspect of the talk. Next is Annabella, and Annabella Okada is going to talk about differentiating posterior uveitis, vasculitis, white dot syndromes, and making it easy for all of us. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Annabelle Okada from Tokyo, Japan. Can you see my slides? Yes, they're perfect. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks, Mark, for that great introduction. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about specific uh, clinical issues. I think that uh, will uh, be more focused on uh, particular findings in the posterior uh, poll and in the fundus. These are my financial disclosures. So I'm going to try to help you decide on a differential diagnosis list based on specific findings. So I'm going to assume that you've already seen the patient, you know how old they are, what their sex is, what their ethnic background is, and Mark uh, spoke a little bit to about how this can help uh, refine your differential diagnosis as well. You've already taken their history, review of systems, you know their visual acuity, their intraocular pressure, and you've looked at their anterior segment. So now comes the posterior segment. You've hopefully dilated their pupils and you're looking at the fundus. And then you need to generate some sort of differential diagnostic list. And the reason is, is because then you want to be able to tailor any uh, ancillary tests based on specific uh, uh, possible diagnoses. And of course that will then guide your treatment. So I'm just gonna concentrate on this uh, posterior segment examination and generating the differential diagnosis. And I'm gonna be covering three specific findings, retinal vasculitis, white dots, and serous retinal detachment. So first retinal vasculitis. Uh, when residents come to me and they say, you know, I have a patient with retinal vasculitis, that doesn't really tell me enough. I ask them, is it mainly arteries or veins or is it both? Uh, are they just engorged vessels and tortuous, or is there actually more evidence of, of, of inflammation? Uh, is there sheathing? Is there vascular occlusion? Is there accompanying papillitis, inflammation of the optic nerve head? Uh, do you have vitreous haze and cells involved as well? Are there retinal hemorrhages, infiltrates, uh, indicative of retinitis, and cotton wool spots, indicative of some ischemia? Uh, and further ischemia would also give you uh, retinal non-perfusion and possibly neovascularization as well. And overall, are we talking about something that is active or 
relatively inactive? Do you have a quickly evolving situation or kind of a chronic smoldering situation or just old changes? So this is a patient of mine who came uh, to me about 20 years ago, 54 years old with the complaint of just eye fatigue. I already knew that she had a 15 year history of rheumatoid arthritis and chronic renal failure. Uh, she had been having fevers for the past month before she came to me and her visual acuities are good. No uh, inflammatory changes in the anterior uh, chamber or in the vitreous. But you can see here that she has bilateral changes to her blood vessels uh, in the retina, and uh, it involves both arteries and veins. And really, it's more of a whitening uh, alongside the, the vessel. So perhaps this is a perivasculitis. Uh, there's some white areas in between the vessels, maybe some uh, largish cotton wool spots, maybe some ischemia involved. The optic nerves don't seem to be inflamed. There's a little bit of peripapillary atrophy, however. And uh, I took a fluorescein andrograph of this patient. So this is a long time ago, um, before we had uh, wide field uh, images, and uh, perhaps I'll be showing you some of those later. But uh, there was no leakage from these vessels. So I interpreted this as being more of a perivasculitis and there was no hyperfluorescence of the disc either. Uh, and so I'd like to just think with you about some of the more common causes of retinal vasculitis. Now, as Mark mentioned, you have to tailor this list to your particular uh, geographic location and ethnic group of uh, ethnic population that you you see because some diseases are obviously going to be more common in where in the areas you live in than they are in Japan and there are going to be other diseases that are more common in Japan for example and I also uh, adhere to in, uh, this overall framework of uh, dividing diseases into infectious versus non-infectious we all do as uvi specialists so the more common causes that are infectious would be syphilis, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, CMV retinitis, and I threw in here frosted branch angiitis as well. And of course, acute retinal necrosis, which could be due to either herpes simplex virus or varicella zoster. The more common systemic diseases causing retinal vasculitis would include sarcoidosis, Bechet's disease, lupus, and multiple sclerosis. And a purely ocular disease would be birdshot choroidopathy which is, by the way, something that we never see in Japan because we have no HLA-A29. Now, less common causes of retinal vasculitis would include the infections such as Lyme disease, uh, Bartonella, Brucella, Leptospirosis, uh, and then human T cell lymphotropic virus one, which we do have in Japan, by the way. So it's a little bit more common in Japan. Now, systemic diseases that are less common uh, but we do see every now and then Takayasu's disease, cranial arteritis, PAN, Kirk Strauss, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, uh, which we used to call Wegener's, uh, microscopic polyangiitis, relapsing polychondritis, inflammatory bowel disease, Sjogren's syndrome, lymphoproliferative disorders. And this is just a partial list. So what did I do in my patient? Well, I already knew that she had rheumatoid arth arthritis and renal disease, and she was actually being followed at a different hospital for those issues. And I wanted her to be seen by um, the rheumatologist at my uh, university. So I did some basic blood tests. I found out that she was anemic. She had a high sed rate. She had a few autoantibodies, including uh, uh, being positive for double-strand DNA antibodies. And so then I got a rheumatology consult because uh, I did some of the basic work for them. And they said, yes, she did fulfill criteria for uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. They treated her for me. She was having fever, so she was systemically uh, having symptoms. They started prednisolone 30 milligrams a day and taped her over a long period of time, four and a half years. Uh, this is a long time ago, so I'm not sure she got any other uh, immune uh, immunosuppressive therapy, but this is what she looked like before and after uh, a long time on treatment. Uh, and she maintained good visual acuity uh, the whole time. But if you look very carefully here, you can see that there's some aftermath of having that uh, perivasculitis. There's some sheathing here of the vessels. And if I had a wide field camera 20 years ago, I would probably show you some very impressive uh, uh, sheathing out in the periphery as well. This is another patient with 
retinal vasculitis. Now, this would be more of a true vasculitis because you can see here on the fluorescein angiogram that there is leakage from the vessels and there's hyperfluorescence of the disc. There's also a pretty heavy component of vitritis. This is a patient with syphilis uh, who complained of blurred vision but was otherwise healthy but was diagnosed with tertiary syphilis. This is another uh, type of vasculitis that is seen in a lot of the world, actually, uh, where certain uh, infectious diseases are, are endemic. And I think some of you already recognize this, uh, having uh, very typical features of what is often called Eels disease, which is a term that I do not like. Uh, I call this TB-related uh, uh, retinal vasculitis. And my patient, this patient in particular, had pulmonary TB, but most of my patients do not have anything in the lungs, and they are usually uh, classified as having uh, extra pulmonary TB. And this is another patient who you've already done the history, actually, so you already know that this patient is a young gentleman who has a history of oral ulcers, uh, recurrent, has genital ulcers, and has skin lesions as well, and then comes in with acute loss of vision in the right eye. And you can see here that there is striking retinitis with uh, accompanying uh, hemorrhages. The disc, the optic nerve looks a little bit inflamed. And when you do a fluorescein angiogram, not only do you see the hyperfluorescence where you would expect to see it with blockage due to the blood, but out in the periphery, and you can see it in the poster pole too, but out in the periphery, it's, it's more striking, this fern-like uh, hyperfluorescence uh, leakage, hy uh, leakage of the uh, fluorescent uh, fluorescein dye uh, from a lot of the small vasculature, uh, the cap uh, capillaries. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, a typical finding in Bechet's disease. And this, again, is com more common in certain parts of the world, including Japan and other countries lining the old Silk Road. Uh, than other places. So this would be higher up on my list, but maybe lower down on the list of some of the people li uh, listening in, into this webinar. And I just want to point you to this wonderful book by uh, our dear friend Manfred, uh, who you just saw at the beginning of the webinar. And I, my guess is this is probably out of print. Maybe Manfred can tell us about this, but if you can find this in some library, it has these wonderful lists uh, of differential diagnoses. And what's good about these lists is that it's just not a list with, with no differentiation. It actually differentiates retinovasculitis plus chorioretinitis. And if it were white dots, what should you think of? Uh, if it's uh, got a, in a component of occlusion, then what should you think of? Uh, if it's more arteries involved or veins involved? Anyway, it's not uh, 100% complete, but it really points you in the right direction and gives you a framework on how to think about uh, what uh, your differential diagnosis should include. And again, base this a little bit on uh, the geographic uh, area that you work in, uh, the age and sex of the patient, et cetera. So I'm going to go on to white dots. And uh, again, we need to characterize the findings a little bit more. Are these really small dots or are they patches? Are they distinct or hazy borders? Do they coalesce over time? Uh, are they at the level of the retina, the RP, or the choroid? Are they soft, hard, atrophic? Are they associated with pigmentation? Is there accompanying papillitis or inflammation of the optic nerve head? Uh, is there a component of retinal hemorrhage, retinal vasculitis, subretinal fluid perhaps, uh, vitreous haze and cells? And as always, we need to know if this is active or inactive. So now the traditional white dot diseases are at the level of the RP and the choroid, and they include uh, MUSE, AMPI, uh, and a sort of a, a widespread, more progressive form of AMPI that uh, has been called in the literature uh, relentless placoid choroiditis, uh, and I've actually uh, published a, a case as well. Some people refer this uh, refer to this as being an impiginous choroiditis. It's sort of a uh, a new uh, way of categorizing this finding. Uh, PIC or punctate intercoridopathy, multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis, birdshot chorioretinitis, and serpiginous choroiditis. Uh, this is a patient of mine who, again, uh, these are old uh, teaching slides, so this is from quite a long time ago, who came in complaining of some reduced vision in the left eye. And you can see here that there are a lot of sort of white spots 
uh, that are more noticeable outside of the uh, arcades and kind of more of a diffuse uh, placoid type of whiteness in the posterior pole. Uh, if I had had uh, fundus autofluorescence back 20 years ago when uh, this patient showed up, uh, you would have seen these white spots more clearly. And this is someone that I diagnosed with uh, multifocal evanescent white dot syndrome. This patient uh, recovered uh, spontaneously without any treatment uh, back to normal vision with uh, nice looking fundus at the end of it all. This is another patient with uh, more uh, uh, patchy type of white lesions, uh, larger than really spots. And you can see here that this is a blondish fundus. So this is in a Caucasian patient. Uh, and this uh, patient came to me when I was doing residency in Boston. Now, uh, I diagnosed this at the time as being uh, acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy. This is a young woman after a flu-like symptom. I uh, did not treat this patient back then, and uh, the patient recovered good visual acuity without any uh, major sequela, except for a little bit of pigmentation in the macula. Now, this is a controversy of whether you should treat or not treat AMPI. Um, and by the way, I don't see any AMPI in Japan. So again, this is another disease that does have geographical variation. Now, this is the patient that I did uh, report as having relentless placoid chorioretinitis. So it looks kind of like AMPI if you just look at the posterior pole, but you can see here that they're just widespread lesions. And this progressed over time. And I did treat this patient with a short course of oral uh, steroids and the patient did recover, uh, but did have some uh, atrophic uh, uh, changes to some of the lesions um, that were uh, near the posterior pole. This is another patient with white dots. Now these are deep to the retina. They look like they are more in the choroid and they indeed are. This patient had a complication of a, a choroidal neovascularization. You can see here that there's some accompanying uh, hemorrhage uh, that I did treat with uh, anti-VEGF uh, uh, injection. And uh, previous to that though, he was having uh, recurrent bouts of vitritis in addition to this uh, fundus that was uh, pretty much the same in both eyes. And this is a patient that I put in the category of multifocal choroiditis with panuvitis, which by the may, way, may be kind of a wastebasket category of uh, diseases, uh, but we're trying to figure it out by at least trying to uh, categorize uh, the, the findings that we see in the clinical course and hopefully come up with an etiology uh, in the future for this disease. This is another patient uh, of mine uh, that I do see in a lot in Japan uh, with who came in with decreased vision in, in the right eye. And no symptoms in the left eye at all. This is back in 2005. And you can see here that there's already scarring in the center of the fovea of the right eye due to an old chordal neovascular uh, membrane event um, and has pigmented scars elsewhere. This is a uh, myopic patient and the left eye had these white areas, these white splotches, some quite near to the fovea. This eye was entirely asymptomatic. So I just watched this patient. And over the course of seven years, you can see here that the right eye hasn't changed very much, but the left eye, you can see here that there's uh, atrophic changes to some of the earlier lesions and a new lesion that popped up later. Um, but this patient uh, never developed a chordal neovascular uh, network in at least the fovea for the left eye. Nowadays, if I do see a new CNV, of course, I would treat with uh, anti-VEGF, but even for inflammatory lesions that are uh, close enough to the fovea, and uh, I would actually treat with either a sub tenons corticosteroid injection or more commonly nowadays, I would give an anti-VEGF uh, agent uh, intravitreally. And this of course is a patient with punctate inner choroiditis, often in myopes. And this is something we do see in Japan. Here is something that we do not see in Japan. This is a patient uh, who has these sort of ovoid uh, white dots that are radiating from the disc. And this is something that is seen more in European uh, populations uh, of the world, uh, including in North America. And as many of you would guess, this is birdshot. Uh, we don't have HLA-A29 in Japan, and I have never seen even one patient with this, uh, although I did see this when I was in Boston. Another patient with very distinct 
uh, white dots. Now, where are these dots? Well, uh, I have a, a OCT uh, that showed me that it was actually under the RP, but I knew that these were already due to recurrence of lymphoma because we had done vitrectomy and diagnosed the vitro retinal lymphoma. The patient was treated by our oncologist and then had recurrence uh, under the RPE, and we treated this next with intravitreal methotrexate. So now there are a lot of other diseases presenting white dots in the fundus at the level of the retina. That would include acute retinal necrosis, fungal retinitis, lymphoma. At the level of the RP and choroid, things like histoplasmosis, Duzen, pneumocystis, cryptococcus, uh, cryptococcus sarcoidosis, VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, and lymphoma. And just to give you another case, this is in the form of a quiz, an elderly gentleman with uh, complaining of redness and decreased vision just in the right eye. Uh, he had had um, some flu-like symptoms, had only counting fingers vision in the right eye, left eye was in completely normal. The anterior segment of the right eye had uh, conjunctival injection, keratic precipitates, interchamber cells, and already posterior iris synechia, the left was normal. And you can see here that there's only a hazy view of the posterior pole, maybe the disc is somewhere here, and there are these white spots in the periphery. So what is this? Could this be multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis? Could this be birdshot choriretinopathy? What about VKH? Acute retinal necrosis? And what about fungal retinitis or endophthalmitis? Well, we already know that we can cross VKH off the list because this is not bilateral. And uh, we can also cross out birdshot because you never see that degree of vitritis in birdshot. So we're left with A, D, and E, and actually, when we were working at this patient, we saw him over the course of a couple of days and we realized that his white spots were coalescing in that periphery. So that narrowed the diagnosis down while we were waiting for the results of a aqueous tap. And yes, we were able to find uh, varicella zoster, uh, DNA by PCR, and this patient had acute ret retinal necrosis. And my last finding, and I need to speak quickly here because I'm running out of time is serous retinal detachments. And again, you need to really characterize this extent. Is it shifting? Is there corneal detachment as well? And are you sure it's not a regmatogenous de uh, retinal detachment or even a traction retinal detachment? Is there accompanying papillitis, retinal vasculitis, choroiditis, vitritis? And again, are we talking about an active progressing uh, disorder or is this an inactive issue? So this is my last case, a 45-year woman who complained of floaters in both eyes. She had had a successful uh, sclera buckling in both eyes a few months prior to when I saw her. Uh, no systemic symptoms, had poor vision by the time I saw her. And you can see here that she had pretty strong anterior segment inflammation with already cynic down uh, pupils, two plus cells. And in the fundus, although it was hard to see because of uh, the fact that the pupils didn't dilate, we could show that there was a uh, thickened uh, posterior wall. And nowadays we would be just doing an OCT, but this again is a patient from a long time ago uh, in my teaching files. Now, because of uh, the patient having had a, a surgery, although it was not a vitrectomy, it was bilateral, uh, uh, scleral buckling, we did know that she had cut down uh, externally for drainage of subretinal fluid. So we were suspecting sympathetic, but other, uh, of course, uh, and VKH you could not diagnose anymore because the patient did have surgery. But other things to in the differential uh, diagnosis list would be sarcoidosis, posterior scleritis, uh, SLE, uveal fusion, uh, central serous and central serous variant with bullous retinal detachment. And then, of course, regmatogenous retinal detachment that you missed and traction retinal detachment that you could have missed. Now, uh, I did do a fluorescein angiogram and found that the uh, discs were a little bit hyperfluorescent. Uh, there was no, uh, there was a little bit of maybe uh, staining at the level of the RP, but no frank pooling of any subretinal fluid, at least in the posterior pole, even though there was some pooling inferiorly. We did suspect, however, that the patient had sympathetic ophthalmia, did a lumbar tap and found uh, 111 white cells per milliliter in the cerebrospinal fluid. 
and also uh, did uh, blood testing for HLA-DR4 and found her to be positive, and our diagnosis was sympathetic ophthalmia. Uh, we treated her anterior segment inflammation with subconjunctival corticosteroid and midriatic injections, and also pulsed her with her with uh, methylprednisolone uh, intravenously, followed by uh, cortico uh, oral corticosteroids with uh, transitioning to cyclosporin. Uh, she did regain a lot of vision uh, after six weeks of treatment, and then after cataract surgery, got back to normal vision. And you can see her really pretty nice-looking fundi, although I have to tell you uh, now that this patient uh, I've now been following for about 15 years and has had recurrences. I've had to transition her onto a biologic agent. She's now in Humira, still doing pretty well, but has had some loss of vision, uh, and she had unfortunately developed glaucoma as well. So I hope that gives you just a short uh, introduction on how to think about uh, things that you see in the posterior segment, uh, but you need to really tailor everything to all the other uh, uh, geographical, ethnic, uh, age, and uh, also systemic issues that you've already uh, gone through with the patient before you even look at their posterior segment to, differ, uh, to de generate this differential diagnosis, which will then lead you to ancillary tests that are specific for what you see and hopefully a treatment that works. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks so much. Sure, Annabelle, very, nice. very simple for all of us, you know. And we continue now with Fernando Arivalo, who will again be talking about differentiating posterior uveitis, the location of inflammation, involvement of vitreous. Over to you, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Manfred and uh, all the leadership of the um, um, society for the kind invitation and the opportunity to speak about location of inflammation in posterior uveitis. And we're going to emphasize uh, a little bit on, on vitreous inflammation. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, which have no relevance to my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Andres Lasave, my former fellow from Argentina. So we know that uveitis is defined as inflammation of uh, the uveal tissue, including the iris, uh, ciliary body, and choroid. And according to uh, the SUN uh, classification, posterior uveitis includes uh, inflammation of the retina and choroid. But we know this kind of spill over to other tissues. Um, the uh, posterior uveitis is present uh, uh, when the inflammation is in the retina and choroid, but it can also affect the RPE retina vitreous, as we are talking about uh, in this particular talk, uh, optic nerve, uh, or even the sclera, uh, which sometimes makes the diagnosis a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we have the uh, different tissues. We're going to emphasize some vitreous involvement in this particular presentation. Um, in terms of the choroid, uh, a pure choroiditis may occur uh, with any of the granulomatous uveitis, uh, including VKH, sarcoidosis, TB, syphilis, or more unusual syndromes, uh, such as Birchard or serpiginous chororetinitis. In VKH disease, the uh, choroidal stroma is uh, selectively generating inflammation uh, with lesions in other structures being uh, spillover of the choroidal uh, inflammation. So this is a, a patient uh, that we saw with bilateral diffuse granulomatous panuveitis associated with uh, exudative retinal detachment. And we can see here the line showing where the uh, OCT was performed. And we can see these bacillary layer detachments that have been very nicely uh, described by uh, Vishali and her group, um, uh, we can see in this patient that has Foco Yanagi Harada, uh, the hypofluorescent spots on the uh, choroid uh, on the fluorescein angiogram that later uh, hyperfluoresce uh, in the perimacular area and the uh, periphery. VKH causes uh, markedly increased uh, choroidal thickness 
uh, during the active disease. And here we have the EDI showing that. Uh, and uh, uh, the corridor thickness also decreases as response to uh, therapy, but I'm not going to get into details because I know, uh, believe, I believe Annabella is going to speak about EDI later on on the webinar. In Birshot, uh, the uh, main finding is the presence of poorly defined creamy color avoid corridor lesions and vitritis. So there is inflammation uh, in the eye, although not very severe. Uh, uh, individuals, uh, lesions have blurry margins measuring from 50 to 300 microns at the level of the RPE or inner choroid uh, scatter in the fundus. Here's an example, and you can see that not only the bilateral creamy color or void lesions can be seen here, but also the uh, degree of vitritis that can be seen in these patients. And uh, the fluorescent angiogram shows uh, uh, hyperfluorescence of the disc, vasculitis, and uh, I uh, had the um, OCT uh, A of these patients, web source. We're working with Jennifer Thorne on a study evaluating uh, the core capillaries, and we can see the uh, flow voids that uh, patients with very short can have um, that can be seen here. And uh, those uh, are correlated with what we can see on, uh, on the ICG. In terms of uh, white dot syndromes, uh, they were nicely described by Annabella. Um, they have many clinical features in common. And uh, in, in terms of how to diagnose them, they are characterized by discrete, multiple wall circumscribed yellow white lesions at the level of the retina, RP, corocapillaris, and choroid. But they have very distinct uh, pattern. Uh, characteristics that allow us to make the differential diagnosis. Uh, this is, uh, uh, let's start with mutes. The, uh, is characterized by the presence of white to yellow white lesions at the level of the RPE in the posterior pole. Um, this is an example, an 18 year old female, healthy uh, with sudden visual decrease uh, of vision uh, uh, for 48 hours, uh, 2200 in the right eye no inflammation in the interior chamber. Uh, you can see the color photograph here demonstrating uh, very faint uh, lesions uh, in the uh, nasal and around the um, vascular arcades, uh, some granularity in the macula, uh, and, which is typical. And uh, we can see here in the fluorescent angiogram early, uh, but in the late frames, we can see much better the hyperfluorescence of these lesions uh, that in the late frames can be seen even uh, much better. You can see here nasally very nicely the lesions in the white field uh, um, angiogram. The uh, visual field is uh, altered and the OCT uh, shows uh, these uh, alterations uh, of the uh, outer retina with uh, hyperreflective projections uh, in the outer nuclear layer. And uh, um, this is the autofluorescence that shows uh, the uh, lesions uh, that are hyper autofluorescent. Uh, and uh, um, at a month, uh, we can see in this particular patients how they are completely gone uh, with a visual acuity improvement to 2025. And the OCT as well, at three months of follow up, we can see complete resolution of the autoretinal uh, changes. In terms of AMPI, uh, it's characterized by placoid lesions involving the outer retina and the RPE. Uh, this is uh, an example. Uh, this is a, a patient, 25 year old female, healthy uh, with visual loss uh, for one week, 20, uh, 30 and 2200. Uh, there was uh, one plus cells in the interior chamber. Uh, you can see the placoid lesions here. Um, and these are flat yellow white lesions at the level of the deep retina and RPE. And uh, you can see that better here. And uh, the fluorescent angiogram shows uh, hypofluorescence in the early phase uh, because of the blockage of the corocapillaris. Uh, and uh, with the regular staining later, you can see the late frames here, uh, which is characteristics. The OCT uh, as well uh, will revere uh, this uh, autoretinal uh, hyperreflectivity 
and uh, subretinal uh, and subsequent uh, outer retinal disruption. You can see that uh, mm, pointed out by the arrows. Um, the uh, nature and localization of the antigen are paramount in determining the site of inflammation. Um, and uh, in cases that are infectious, um, uh, like toxoplasma, uh, the parasite has a predilection for neural tissue, um, as well as, uh, of course, in several vital organisms such as HSV and CMV. Uh, however, Bechet's disease, which is a non-infectious disease uh, that may cause retinitis, all of them are associated with uh, vitreous uh, involvement as well. So let's look at some examples. Uh, toxoplasmic uh, retinochoroiditis. We have a patient uh, that has this uh, mm, hyper, um, this uh, um, whitish lesion, uh, inferotemporal. Uh, the lesion starts on the superficial retina and then involves uh, the uh, full thickness of the retina and choroid. Uh, some, uh, the vitreous as well is involved and even the sclera. And you can see the OCT that is typical there. Uh, retinal opacities, uh, the border is very uh, blurry due to the surrounding edema, and later on the border becomes very well defined uh, after therapy. In herpetic acute um, retinal necrosis, uh, this is a typical example. Again, uh, they have the uh, triad of uh, severe retritis, uh, arteritis, and periphlebitis, and confluent peripheral retinal necrosis. So another example. Uh, with uh, involvement of the vitreous. In cytomegalovirus, uh, the vitreous involvement depends on the immunity of the patient. Uh, we can see this necrotizing retinitis uh, with hemorrhage and vitritis can be low grade. Uh, again, depending on the immune status, if the patient has immune reconstitution, they can have uh, significant uh, involvement of the vitreous as well. Uh, this is an example of Bechet's disease. You can see the gray white retinal lesions and hemorrhage, uh, and uh, vasculitis, uh, as, as was nicely shown by um, Annabelle as well. Uh, this is another example where we can see um, unilateral, um, very striking areas of retinitis with significant vitreous uh, involvement, uh, and the classical vasculitis with macular edema, and the ICG showing late hypo uh, fluorescent uh, and hyper and hypersanescent dots as well. Um, this is uh, in posterior uveitis, uh, vitritis is often a prominent feature and the degree of vitritis may range from mild to severe and it depends on the area of retinitis. If it is a large area of retinitis, we may have more uh, vitritis and this is uh, an example of different cases of uh, um, toxoplasmosis with uh, more vitritis associated to larger lesions of, of uh, toxoplasmosis. Um, so the larger lesions are accompanied by severe vitritis and might exhibit, exhibit even the classic headlight on the fog sign uh, that uh, we can see here in this particular case. Um, this is another uh, toxic case, a 47-year-old male with a visual loss to, in the right eye uh, to counting fingers. And uh, after trimetropine sulfamethoxazole and oral clindamycin, uh, we can see the resolution uh, at three months. Um, this is uh, another patient, a 72-year-old female, uh, visual loss in the right eye to counting fingers. Uh, there were some cells in the anterior chamber, and we can see significant inflammation in the vitreous. Uh, you can see that here, uh, vitreous cells 2 plus, haze 3 plus, uh, the arrows demonstrate the area of uh, re significant retinitis. And the uh, patient was treated with Bactrim and uh, intravitreal uh, clindamycin. Uh, we can see resolution of the lesion. However, uh, there was a uh, significant vitreous condensation that was associated with significant vitreal lo vitreal visual loss and the patient underwent uh, vitrectomy to clear the visual axis and allow for uh, uh, improvement uh, in visual acuity in this patient. Sometimes vitrectomy is necessary. And we can see here 
after vitrectomy, uh, they clear up the visual, visual axis, visual acuity improved to 2040. You can see the heel lesion. Uh, this is another patient, uh, an 80 year old male with a history of congenital torch, uh, had severe psychomotor retardation, was evaluated uh, with decreased vision in both eyes of one month duration. That was hard to tell because of her uh, condition. Ophthalmologic examination showed retinal detachments and young retinal tears in both eyes. And that can happen again because of the vitreous involvement uh, in patients with uh, posterior pole um, infection. Um, this, is, this was probably uh, toxoplasmosis. Uh, and uh, um, we decided to perform bilateral phaco and vitrectomy. This is part of a a study uh, on bilateral sequential vitrectomy that we have submitted with my colleague and friend Juan Yepes from Venezuela. Uh, and, uh, and we can see here the um, retinal detachment with uh, young retinal tear and PVR. Uh, you see the, the uh, lesions in the posterior pole and the periphery, uh, the scars from the infection. Um, the complete vitrectomy is performed fluorocarbon is injected uh, so that uh, everything, all the uh, vitreous uh, inflammation is uh, uh, eliminated and the traction, and uh, then uh, we can uh, perform endolaser uh, to uh, the periphery of the retina and, uh, and reattach the retina and uh, um, then aspirate the fluorocarbon uh, with an air fluid exchange uh, and, and leave silicone oil. This is the other eye. So uh, we do um, the FACO uh, with uh, lateral illumination as we have described. And, uh, uh, and then uh, 23 gauge, uh, small gauge vitrectomy. Uh, and you can see the other eye very similar. This, why, this eye was worse. We can see the lesions in the back of the eye, significant PVR of the, uh, with the giant retinal tear. The, the, the borders of the uh, giant tear were, were uh, rolled and we see some, uh, some tears were radial uh, and uh, uh, after a complete vitrectomy and uh, eliminating all the traction, uh, perfluorocarbon is injected uh, to uh, flatten the retina and allow for uh, then uh, the uh, treatment of the um, uh, endolaser uh, to uh, complete the case with uh, uh, air fluid exchange and, and silicone oil. We can see that there are some holes in, in the uh, periphery and that was uh, um, uh, treated. Uh, we treat around the areas of the uh, core retinal atrophy because many times uh, recurrences occur because of new tears that develop in those areas. Uh, so laser is applied to the periphery of the uh, giant tear and, uh, and then uh, an air fluid exchange is performed uh, again to uh, finish the case then uh, with, uh, uh, with silicone oil. Let me see how to move forward. This is another patient that was referred to me, a 25-year-old woman, uh, woman uh, renal sepsis secondary to lithiasis, requiring 18 days of hospitalization, 10 days in the ICU, receiving antibiotics. Uh, at win one week later, she was referred for progressive decrease of visual acuity in her left eye. Uh, she had a hypopion. The visual acuity was counting fingers. Uh, we can see uh, these fluffy white lesions on the surface of the retina and uh, uh, significant uh, vitritis, uh, uh, snowballs uh, inferiorly. Uh, we suspected uh, fungal endophthalmitis. And again, a vitrectomy was performed for diagnosis and therapeutic purposes. Uh, the uh, treatment of these cases is difficult. Uh, the um, treatment of systemic tr treatment had already been started. Uh, but here, intravitreal antibiotics, but also the vitrectomy uh, is uh, important in this particular case because of the uh, suspicious of fungal, of course, intravitreal fungal uh, is uh, um, uh, important. Uh, here, I like to perform a peripheral 
hole uh, on the um, uh, posterior hyoid, uh, in the mid periphery of the posterior hyoid to inject perfluorocarbon between the posterior hyoid and the retina to separate the posterior hyoid uh, from the retina on a technique that we call perfluorodissection uh, uh, to uh, um, separate in a very atraumatic way the um, posterior hyoid from the retina and then the vitrectomy uh, can be completed. Typically, uh, it's been uh, recommended that a vitrectomy is done in a partial way in patients with endophthalmitis because the um, retina is very friable, but it, using this technique, we can uh, and patients have uh, a much better prognosis. Uh, we're completing uh, the vitrectomy, and then after that, uh, with very good visualization, we can uh, aspirate uh, the perfluorocarbon uh, and uh, even eliminate some of the uh, pegs that are uh, easy to aspirate, for example, here from the uh, optic disc uh, to uh, then just leave uh, uh, air uh, in the vitreous cavity, about two thirds of the vitreous cavity, and then uh, intravitreal uh, uh, antifungals can be uh, injected as well. This is a day eight uh, with significant improvement at two months, 20, 30 visual acuity in this particular patient. This is another example uh, of a, a case, uh, now it's non-infectious, a case of PIC, 35-year-old female, uh, previously healthy with floaters, uh, 20, 30 in both eyes, uh, no uh, cells in the anterior chamber. Uh, we can see uh, the lesions in the posterior pole here. Uh, and uh, um, those uh, lesions are usually small, uh, multiple punctate lesions involving the choroid and the retina. And um, the, uh, it is important that in some entities, the lack of vitreous inflammation is important to make a diagnosis. So the, the, the lack of vitreous inflammation in PIC is, is, uh, is hallmark to make the diagnosis. And the, if, if we had this same clinical picture and vitritis, we should think about something different uh, other than, than PIC. Uh, here we have examples of the autofluorescence of this patient. Uh, it, it shows some uh, hyper autofluorescence spots that come from the inferior retina, uh, but also the hypo autofluorescence spots in both eyes that correspond to areas of RPE atrophy. This is the OCT uh, that demonstrates disruption of photoreceptors in the uh, um, uh, at the level of the inner segment, uh, ellipsoid and external limited membrane, and uh, chororetinal lesions at the level of the inner choroid and RPE. Uh, this is another case. Uh, this is of multifocal choroiditis, a 37-year-old woman, uh, previously healthy, blurry vision in both eyes, floaters, photopsias. Uh, the anterior chamber had uh, one plus uh, cells uh, with fine KP, in both eyes, I'm showing you the left eye before uh, with vitreous cells uh, and, and, and two plus haze. Uh, again, a significant inflammation uh, that improved at two months uh, with the uh, uh, dosages of uh, increased dosages of uh, methotrexate and an intravitreal dexamethasone implant therapy as well. So, in terms of uh, how the vitreous can help uh, to make diagnosis in, in the white dot syndrome spectrum. Uh, keep in mind that uh, there is no vitreous involvement uh, typically in PIC, in acute retinal pigment epithelitis, uh, in acute macular neuroretinitis, in serpiginous choroiditis and azor. And yes, there is involvement of the vitreous in multifocal uh, choroiditis and panuviitis, uh, virtual chororetinopathy, mutes, and ampi. So in summary, uh, the finding of vitreous cells may exclude some disorders, but may also support other types of diagnosis. Uh, the primary pathologic process at or near the choroid RPE and the outer retina occur more frequently in non-infectious uveitis cases. And in cases of retinitis, uh, nearly always uh, think about infectious uh, um, diagnosis. Uh, it is crucial to know the anatomical location of the inflammatory process uh, because, because it is one of the most important clues to understand the pathogenesis of the disease, and the clinical judgment is key uh, to the diagnosis and management 
of intraocular inflammation. Thank you so much for the kind opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando, very much. And uh, now we move on again to Mark, who will tell us about diagnostics of posterior uveitis, and then we come back to all the speakers about imaging. Can I tell you shortly that we are eight minutes over time already? So please. Yes, um, I'll try to necessary. do what I can. Thanks. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Perfect. Yes, all good. good. Okay. So let me turn my timer on. So that helps me stay with on time. So I'm going to talk about diagnosis and posterior uveitis. And we have only uh, about 12, um, I guess, nine minutes, 10 minutes to talk about. Let me start with an illustrative case that I saw several years ago. This is a 22 year old Caucasian that complains of distorted vision and floaters for about five months. His vision's not bad. He has a quiet anterior chamber. And in the vitreous and retina, I've already showed you more or less what was we were dealing with um, in one of the pictures with pars planitis. And you can see he has a bit of a membrane in his left eye. There's really very little at the level of the uh, fluorescein. And these are the laboratory tests that he underwent. So these are probably okay. It's a uh, C-reactive protein, said rate to know if there's a problem. Liver function's not quite sure. CBC makes uh, some sense. Um, they then went on to calcium, lysozyme uh, for syphilis, quantiferon, Lyme, Bartonella, rickettsia, brucellosis, a hell of a lot of tests that you can ask yourself, is this all really required if in fact the diagnosis is a pars planitis? Why do we want to do testing? Well, you know, uveitis could be a manifestation of something else. Um, and we want to know if we can identify a cause and treat it rather than just deal with an idiopathic uh, situation. Although that something else could be, of course, an infection problem that we want to deal with. And don't forget that there are also some uveitics, uh, uveitis pictures that may have an inherent a ge a genetic background. And not infrequently, all of us have seen cases of what look like chronic uveitis. And when we really start looking very carefully, the vessels are very attenuated. There's a strange pigmentation in the posterior pole. And when we finally think about it, we in fact find that the patient has retinitis pigmentosa with uveitis. For the rest, yeah, we have syndromes and we want to pro uh, have a, or, or a prognostic framework. So with regards to that, how should you approach diagnosis? Well, know the most common entities and we've presented a lot of them and I've mentioned that to you a bit earlier. You should know what's present in your region and you, know, you should complete your initial exam before you start ordering tests and know that there are some seasonal variations. Certain diseases are more common in the winter months or in the summer. And on the right, you have the most common infectious causes, syphilis, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis and herpetic viruses. Inflammation, depending on where you live, it's going to vary. Sarcoidosis is a bit everywhere, Bechet's, VKH. And then, you know, we go down the list, birdshot in my part of the world, but you won't see it in Asia. And, uh, you know, you're going to see more Bechet's and VKH along the Silk Road. Common infections, we've already talked about. Toxoplasmosis, this is one case. This is another case of, uh, uh, this is a herpetic infection. This is syphilis, this is another case of syphilis, and here's a case of TB, another case of TB. So things can present in different ways, and it's important to be able to recognize these patterns if you can. So the screening test syphilis and TB in virtually all cases, I've just proven to you that that's the case. For the others, it really depends on the class of patients you're dealing with. Parsplenitis, a vasculitis inside the retina, and intermediate uveitis, particularly in somebody who spends a lot of time walking in the woods, well, you should test for Lyme, but it probably will be useless if you have somebody with white dot syndromes. And when you're looking for associated uh, systemic disease, what you have is a context in which your, uh, the type of patient you have from a symptoms will be very useful in terms of increasing the likelihood of getting a positive diagnosis. Recognize the syndromes, what the associated uh, features are of Bichette's disease, you know, the presence of uh, um, ulcers in the mouth and in the genitalial area, the fact that they have pathology, they may have had some vascular occlusions in the past or neurologic symptoms, VKH early on with uh, headaches, uh, meningismus, la loss of hearing, uh, or otherwise deep uh, depigmentation. And of course, we'll come back to sarcoidosis, 
and in sarcoidosis, the lung is most commonly affected, but also the spleen and liver and the skin to a lesser extent, more so in kids where they can have rashes. And so this orients to some extent how you're going to uh, do the exams. Chest X-ray and MRIs are very useful. The ACE uh, may be very useful, but you know a gallium scan in itself, not so much. A high ACE is useful in association with other uh, features. If you have lymphopenia, and if you have, for example, the presence of iris nodules or granulomatosis, it will increase the positivity of your result. But the ACE has to be at least 1.5 higher than your upper limit of normal. Otherwise, it doesn't really mean all that much. And this is true whether you have a person that has had a chest CT or it's had bronchoscopy and uveitis. And notice here that if you accumulate three factors, the presence of snowballs or peripheral multifocal choroiditis associated with lymphopenia and ACE levels, the likelihood that you're going to be able to diagnose sarcoidosis under these conditions is very high. Now, um, there are other tests that may be better in terms of being able to diagnose um, uh, an active disease. ACE is very nice. Uh, it tells you that there is generalized inflammation inside the, uh, the body. And in 10% of cases, it will orient you to a diagnosis, whether it's sarcoidosis or another. But the IL-2 receptors, if you're able to measure it in your area, is even more diagnostic. It separates much better, as you can see here, cases of sarcoidosis from the, those that are controls, much better than can be achieved with just uh, ACE uh, in the same population. Now, I've talked about pretest probabilities. Um, this is a scenario that is a bit invented, but it shows you very clearly the importance of trying to do your, your investigation before and decide which tests you want to do. So if we take a test that is 90% sensitive, 90% specific, and half the population is infected, yes, 90% of people that are positive are the ones that have the disease. But if we only have 10%, then in fact, it's a 50-50. And this is important with TB. So if you have a high endemic probability, yes, doing tests such as a MANTU or PPD is going to be useful. And here we have a sensitivity and specificity that is much lower. And today in many places, in fact, this is becoming more and more difficult and quantiferon has become more or less the norm because of its specificity. But even here, if you have a diagnosis that is above two, then you should probably treat with anti-tuberculous medication. This applies to the Western world, but I think it would apply also to areas of endemic disease. If it's under two, it depends on, is there a tuberculous contact? And if not, then maybe you should get a tuberculin skin test of course, you have to be very careful if you have BCG uh, vaccination in the past because that may give you a positive man too. But again, there it depends on the degree of positivity. If there's spectacular disease, well, I think in those cases, yes, you should treat with anti-TB medication. Syphilis is another uh, area where we would treat, we would try to diagnose and we'll use a syphilis specific test to be able to identify the patient. But then again, once you become positive on this test, it's lifelong positivity. And some people who develop syphilis, it's due to a certain type of, let's say, um, uh, um, living uh, condition or habits. And so they may reinfect themselves by exposure. And in that case, the, the specific tests won't be positive. They, they're already positive. And a VDRL, which is a lot less sensitive because there are other reasons for having cardiolipin-rich conditions, these return to normal after treatment for syphilis. And if they redevelop the disease, well, it becomes positive again. So getting a VDRL may be useful, particularly in a high risk population, just to be able to eliminate the reinfection. Ocular tuxo is another condition where um, is very common and is worth talking about. Um, recurrences tend to occur in the first five years. And the reason I wanted to mention this is because while most systemic testing for uh, serum tests for antibodies doesn't yield very much. The fact that you find an IgM may be useful in patients with toxo. Why? Because toxo can have many presentations. And I'm showing you here all cases of toxo, uh, of toxo patients. So this is the light in the fog, the one we would expect. The one on the right was in fact a patient of mine that had AIDS and it's uh, something that we don't really see much anymore. But the one down to the left is a patient sent to me with a potential diagnosis of ARN. There was a lot of vitritis at the time, 
and we made the diagnosis as we were planning a vitrectomy to remove all traction in that area. And I'll come back to the one down to the right. What about radiologic testing? Radiologic testing is a chest x-ray is easy to take. It doesn't have a high sensitivity and specificity is okay if you have a biopsy proven sarcoidosis elsewhere. Thoracic scans or PET scans are much more sensitive, but much more costly. And they may be more useful in patients over 50 that have neg uh, negative radiologic tests. And I would do an MRI much more than I would a chest X-ray to try and diagnose the presence of hyder adenopathy or adenopathy within the lungs. Also useful if you're looking at TB. Brain MRIs in the presence of neurologic signs, or if you're going to start anti-TNF therapy, otherwise there isn't really much role for that. What are useful tests? Well, uh, look for isophenia because of parasites. Raised uh, white blood counts may indicate the presence of an infection, though if it's specific to the eye, the increase will be very limited. Lymphocytosis in viral infections, lymphopenia in, uh, uh, in sarcoidosis. C-reactive protein, as I've mentioned earlier, may be indicative of a, a inflammatory process even in the eye in 10% of cases, more so than just doing an ESR. Liver functions we've talked about before, and there are other tests you could consider. Do minimal routine uveitis workup at first, and only consider going further if you don't really find anything useful in your first workup. And your second will look more based on the anatomic types of uveitis we've talked in the past. Then depending on if you have no diagnosis and the patient is getting worse, that's when you have to go for more investigations, either by systemic or looking at more specifically inside the eye, an anterior chamber tap, which can be easily done as shown here, or otherwise behind the slit lamp, if you use a syringe, a 30 gauge needle, and you've removed the plunger, getting it to the anterior chamber, a bit of pressure on the other side will allow you to remove 0.1 cc's of fluid. You remove your syringe before you remove the pressure and you have what you need in order to do either PCR, otherwise trying to obtain a Goldman Wittmer based on antibody production inside the eye. The problem with Goldman Wittmer is that it is useful, but there are very few centers today that are able to do it. And even if you can get it in many of these centers, it's extremely toxic, uh, costly. PCR will tend to be more positive if you have inflammation present in the eye. And this is a study that sort of shows you PCR positivity in many conditions, but there are some where the uh, Goldman Wittmer is positive and PCR is negative. So if you can get both, do both, it will increase your your risk of uh, your likelihood of getting a diagnosis. If you're doing a vitreous biopsy, there are two ways. You can do it under air. You bring air in and you remove the vitreous. I tend to prefer to indent the periphery as here to the right because you get a better view and you can remove up to one 1.5 cc's of uh, uh, vitreous material. That's our fourth case I showed you. Before we went to more invasive disease, we didn't know what it was at the time. We just sent the vitreous off. And what do we see here are tachyzoites inside a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a macrophage. And this corresponds to toxoplasmosis. If you do need to do a biopsy, they can be done externally or internally. You want to be able to have confluent laser. And then you, you cut out the piece of retina and cord you want to look at down to sclera. And then the best way to get a good sample out is to aspirate it through a very large bore needle that you've put in a 19 or 20 gauge would be best. There are very few conditions where you need to do this anymore. The reason would be if you think it's a choroidal process and you might lose orientation of retina and choroid and you find that it's important. If you're going to do these kind of biopsies, you definitely have to get both healthy as well as diseased tissue in the area. You have to be neurotic with this. You want to do extensive testing, microbiology, cytology, pathology, everything you can think of. And you have to make sure that everybody's ready to receive your very small sample. So in conclusion, laboratory testing are mainly to confirm. Some tests are preparatory prior to therapy. In particular, think about MRIs for uh, the use of anti-TNF. And we haven't talked about it, but you know, uh, there are a lot more genomics and proteomics and, uh, uh, um, uh, and gut omics which will change our approach in the coming years and uh, are allowing us to diagnose things that otherwise would be difficult to find. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We will now briefly discuss imaging because we have an entirely different webinar coming up on imaging, but just some imaging point in context of posterior uveitis. It's Fernando. 
who's going to tell us about general OCT, followed by Annabelle for EDI OCT, and Mark in imaging, the macular edema. So we go on to Fernando. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me try to briefly summarize a little bit about OCT. Again, my financial disclosures and recognize Andres Lasave from Argentina. Um, this, uh, we know that OCT has become an indispensable tool in the diagnosis and management of patients with uh, uveitis. And uh, it's a diagnostic imaging modality with high resolution uh, of cross-section on the images of ocular structures. Uh, has very rapidly evolved from 10 domain to spectral domain. Uh, most recently, EDI, OCT, swept source, OCT, and OCTA, which will be uh, the topic of one webinar in the future. It allows for an optical biopsy. Uh, we can see uh, very clearly um, the layers of the retina with OCT. And there, there are several inflammatory diseases that uh, can occur in the posterior segment of the eye, as we just uh, saw today, classified uh, depending on uh, what tissue is involved. And uh, that uh, can lead to a variety of manifestations of inflammation. So let's uh, look at a little bit about uh, how can we use OCT. Um, Swept source OCT has been evaluated uh, on the uh, use for assessing the anterior cells, anterior chamber cells and aqueous flare objectively. Uh, this is a study by uh, Invernissi uh, et al. Uh, on, uh, on this topic. And this is an example of uh, the uh, grade four uh, uh, cells in the anterior chamber and an OCT. So this is still not something that we do in clinical practice, but maybe with future software, uh, is going to be uh, something that we uh, be able to be uh, using uh, more frequently. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, posterior segment scan analysis, it can uh, identify structural changes of the retina and choroid, again, uh, in uveitis and, and its complications. So let's uh, look at some cases. Uh, uh, this is a, a patient uh, with multifocal choroiditis, a 35-year-old female. Uh, that was treated with metotrexate for two years, uh, visual distortion uh, in the right eye. So um, here the vision is uh, 2100 uh, in the right eye, 2030 in the left eye, and uh, uh, we see the OCT in both eyes. So the right eye has uh, a significant edema and, uh, and has an epiretinal membrane. And several studies shown before uh, that um, when you have macular edema and a significant uh, epiretinal membrane, uh, this is a surgical case. So it's important to keep that in mind. This is not a macular edema that is going to improve um, with just therapy. Um, the uh, presence of an epiretinal membrane that is significant is a risk factor for non-improvement of, of, uh, with therapy. So we need to, it's a surgical case. Uh, this is a 20-year-old female with bilateral visual loss of one week, duration, headache, uh, 2100 and 2080, visual acuity, anterior chamber cells of two plus in both eyes. And we see the hyperemic disc in both eyes here uh, on the fluorescein angiogram. And, uh, and, and it's a patient with uh, focal Yanagi Harada. Uh, we see the uh, central macular thickness, uh, uh, central choroidal thickness increase visual acuity is 2050 and 2080. And, uh, and um, this is something that is characteristic. And again, uh, with uh, therapy, steroids and methotrexate, uh, we can see reduction on central macular thickness. So it's a way to follow uh, these patients with VKH. Um, here is uh, another case, a 46 year old female with visual loss in the left eye uh, without current systemic therapy, chronic stage of VKH disease and uh, we see the uh, white field imaging of both eyes with the punch out lesions in the periphery. The fluorescein angiogram shows the uh, hyperfluorescent uh, of the lesions and the OCT shows changes that uh, in both maculas, but especially the left eye, you can see this macular edema uh, with subretinal fluid and after uh, an injection of Osrodex, 
uh, we see reduction on, on the uh, uh, central choroidal thickness and the macular edema with improvement of visual acuity uh, to 2040 at two months of follow-up. Uh, so it really improves uh, inflammation. Uh, this is a 22-year-old female with multifocal choroiditis, decreasing vision in the right eye, 2200 in the right eye, uh, no cells in the anterior chamber. And uh, you can see here the uh, photographs uh, of the fundus, color photographs, and the fluorescent angiogram shows very nicely a hyperfluorescence that increases with leakage late in the right eye, and we can see this uh, type two choroidal novascularization on the OCT, uh, a structural OCT, and patient was treated with anti-VGF therapy, three anti-VGF therapy injections, and improves. Uh, this is a uh, toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis patients that I showed you before uh, on my talk, but the OCT is very nice to show the vitritis and the uh, choroidal involvement. So it's retino, uh, choroidal involvement with a spillover to the vitreous, and we can see that uh, here, retinochoroiditis. Uh, this is a 12-year-old female, 2400 in the right eye, 2100 in the left eye, uh, multiple uh, serous retinal detachments. We can see the uh, typical uh, hyperfluorescence in both eyes, especially in the right eye. You can see the pooling of the hyperfluorescence, uh, typical of VKH. 2400 in the right eye, uh, 2100 in the left eye, and bacillary uh, layer detachment, uh, which uh, again represents and uh, described by uh, Vishali, an intraretinal split at, at the photoreceptor in a segment, segment myoid. Uh, and this uh, separation leaves uh, the bacillary layer attached to the RPE, whereas the external limited membrane and remaining anterior retinal structures detach and move anteriorly. And we can see that beautifully here uh, with subretinal fluid, uh, the presence of outer retinal cystoid space and uh, remaining myoid zone, uh, as well as the, the uh, presence of the external limited membrane with remnants of the uh, myoid zone and some fibrin uh, material as well. Uh, this is this patient was treated with a combination of uh, esteroids and uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and we can see the reduction in the right eye of the bacillary detachment to normalization of the OCT three months later. This is a 24-year-old female with floaters, uh, visual acuity loss. Uh, we can see another bacillary detachment with the same characteristics that I'm not going to uh, repeat. Um, and, uh, but this is another condition, toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis in zone one, you can see the lesion here, and the patient uh, um, was, uh, uh, you can see the fluorescein angiogram with uh, hyperfluorescence and an area centrally of hypofluorescence uh, treated with Bactrin and intravitreal uh, clindamycin. At two years of follow-up, you see the resolution of the lesion and the OCT shows resolution of the bacillary layer detachment. This is a 38-year-old male with progressive loss of vision for two months in the left eye, redness, photophobia in both eyes, high, uh, had a, um, a pyoderma granginosa on, on oral esteroids for three months. Uh, visual acuity was 2030 and 2100. Um, the, uh, there were cells in the anterior chamber, one plus cells, uh, you can see the uh, fundus pictures here, and the uh, white field uh, color photographs demonstrates this um, retinitis uh, with uh, some retinal precipitates in the fundus, uh, which are typical uh, for one condition. You can see the uh, presence of the in the outer retina uh, of uh, significant disturbance. The fluorescent angiogram shows hyperfluorescence. Let me go back. You can see that here. And the, uh, we made the diagnosis of ocular syphilis, uh, crystalline penicillin in the venous leaf was given and the patient improved significantly. You can see the photographs, uh, significant improvement and also the OCT uh, with uh, resolution of the outer, uh, outer retina as well as significant improvement in visual acuity. You can see that here on the uh, OCT, recovery of the outer layers after therapy. 
Uh, this is a 70 year old female with a visual decrease in the um, uh, left eye for one month, 2050 visual acuity. You can see granuloma. Uh, this is uh, um, ocular uh, toxocariasis. You can see how the uh, OCT shows these lesions to be with significant uh, uh, disorganization of the retinal layers. Um, this is a, a 22 year old uh, male uh, with visual loss in the left eye for two weeks. No cells, no flare in the anterior chamber. And uh, we can see uh, in the macula, uh, interretinal and subretinal fluid, uh, visual acuity was 2080. And here uh, it was associated to the presence of another uh, granuloma. Um, this retinal granuloma can be seen here uh, with the uh, presence of the uh, uh, involvement of the uh, retina and uh, uh, had a history of uh, pets, a puppy, and IEG antibodies were positive for uh, Toxocara. So in summary, um, very rapidly wanted to demonstrate the, uh, that OCT can help quantify several macular pathologies in uveitis, uh, and uh, it's useful to see the retinal changes and, and choroidal and vitreous. Uh, it's useful in follow-up uh, after therapy increases and complements the value of fluorescein and geography and new applications as we learn more with research and clinical uh, uh, use of OCT uh, help us uh, find new ways to, to use OCT. Um, ultra high fast resolution OCT is becoming available, adaptive optics OCT, wide field OCT, intraoperative OCT and of course OCT and geography is a reality uh, and it's getting better, and we'll talk about it in future webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando. Now we go to Annabel, who will talk about PDIOCT. Okay, uh, hello everyone again. Can you see my slides? Yeah, all good. Yes. Okay, let me just turn on the slideshow. So I'm going to be uh, talking about corridor imaging uh, using EDI OCT for specifically VKH disease and posterior scleritis, uh, which is why I kind of didn't talk too much about VKH disease in my first talk. These are my financial disclosures. I tell the residents that we live in the imaging era. When I was a resident in Boston a long time ago, uh, all we had was fluorescein and geography, and we thought this was great. And now look at how much we have to use in our arsenal. Uh, I'm going to be focusing, though, on the one that I love for VKH uh, disease, which is EDI OCT, which uses the spectral domain uh, machine um, from Heidelberg, although you can st also image the cord with swept source. Uh, just to plug that machine as well. Uh, so we all know that uh, we can now measure choroidal thickness. We can actually look at the choroid now, which is something uh, new for some of us who are uh, from a long time ago. We want to uh, know, however, what normal uh, choroidal thickness is, and there are some controls that have been published. Uh, so I want you to remember this figure somewhere between 280 maybe to 330. Uh, Spades Group in New York uh, did a lot of this uh, work. This decreases with age, and it also decreases with degree of myopia. We know that the cord is thick in central serous choroidopathy, and uh, there are many papers about this. And you can see some examples here. Uh, it can be very thin in high myopia, and this is an example of a patient actually who has a relatively thick choroid for high myopia. I've seen paper thin uh, choroids uh, in high myopes. Now, why is this useful in VKH disease? Well, because for early manifestations, if you have subretinal fluid, serous retinal detachments, then it's easy to diagnose this disease. Um, but with equivocal fundus findings, you need to show that you have focal choroidal filling by de uh, filling delay by fluorescein angiography, as well as diffuse choroidal thickening by ultrasonography without evidence of posterior scleritis. And this is the revised international diagnostic criteria that we all use. This has been around for about 20 years now. It's probably time to revisit it. However, uh, just to focus on this issue of 
doing an ultrasound on our VKH patients, this is so cumbersome. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to uh, easy quantification, and you don't really know where the choroid stops and uh, starts. It, it, all you're doing is really measuring the thickness of the posterior wall of the globe. Uh, this patient, though, you know, does have characteristic findings of VKH in both eyes and does have serous retinal detachments in both eyes. So we all now do use enhanced depth imaging OCT because you can do it every time the patient walks through the door. It's non-invasive, doesn't uh, involve uh, injection of dye. Now I do do fluorescein angiography as well as ICG angiography in the initial uh, diagnosis of the patient. But then I follow the patient with my trusty EDI OCT. So these are two different patients, one here on the left and one here on the right. At presentation, you cannot tell where the border of the choroid is against the sclera at presentation. Once you start treating the patient, you can see where the choroid ends and the sclera starts. And I just outlined it here with some arrowheads and you can measure the choroidal thickness. And you can see here the patient on the left in the 400s, the patient on the right is still very high up in the 600s. Uh, the, the, the left eye here is 880 microns, incredibly uh, thick. And then at three months after starting treatment, you can see here that we're now close to normal range, uh, 300s and even thinner than perhaps normal in the patient here on the right who had a lot of inflammation initially. And then at 12 months, you see here that there's a pretty much stable choroidal thickness. And we've uh, published this data if anybody wants to look at this in retina in 2012. Now, what happens when you get a recurrence? Well, interestingly enough, this patient uh, had uh, tapered uh, successfully. You know, I do pulse my patients with intravenous uh, methylprednisolone. I admit them to the hospital. I pulse them at least once, if not twice, or sometimes three times nowadays. Um, and then I put them on oral steroids taper over about a year or so, depending on the patient. But uh, this patient who had in, uh, successfully tapered off completely and had really normal uh, thickness of choroidal uh, of, their, of his choroids, then had a recurrence. And I just want you to remember these numbers, 318 and 335. With recurrence, this went to over uh, double in the 700s. And uh, this patient, uh, though, did not have any subretinal fluid, no serous retinal detachment at all. And the visual acuity was actually completely normal, so at 1.2 in both eyes. But I knew that this patient had a recurrence and need to be put on, back on systemic treatment. And because uh, I knew this was going to take a longer time to get him off steroids, I did combine with uh, immunosuppressives and the agent that is available for use uh, using the Japanese health uh, healthcare system is cyclosporin. Uh, this patient eventually, though, did very well after one week of being put back on systemic uh, treatment, was back uh, to his baseline, and then at one month was thinner than what he had been at his uh, baseline before the recurrence. Now, patients who tend to have a lot more inflammation or inflammatory recurrences tend to have thinner choroids at the end of the, the day, and I will show you some of that data later. So this is uh, choroidal thickness in 36 uh, patients with acute new onset VKH, patient, uh, VKH over a six-year period. And as I mentioned before, at presentation, you really can't uh, judge their choroidal thickness, but after starting treatment at one week, uh, you can uh, start measuring the choroidal thickness and it goes down with treatment. Uh, these are uh, significantly different compared to the choroidal thickness at one week. Uh, now, the mean uh, choroidal thickness at one week was about 500 microns. So uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kano, uh, decided that, well, let's look at the data by dividing these patients into two different groups, ones with thicker choroids at uh, one week and one with ones with thinner choroids at one week. And this gave some really interesting uh, data because the thicker choroid patients tended to be thinner towards the end compared to patients with uh, not as thick choroids in the beginning. So the more inflammation, the more severe inflammation there was, the, uh, the greater uh, atrophy of the choroidal tissues occurred. And that makes sense uh, to us uh, pathologically. Uh, however, despite uh, 
those changes in cortical thickness, both groups had good visual acuity, good visual outcomes, and this is in LOGMAR, so zero is, is basically 20-20 vision. Uh, however, there was a statistically significant difference along the way, uh, although both groups did very well in terms of visual acuity, and we are in the process of getting this data out. Uh, now, uh, there was also a difference in terms of how much intersegment inflammation there was at presentation. So patients who had thicker choroids at one week of treatment had more uh, intersegment inflammation, including keratic precipitates, greater than two plus anterior cells, posterior synechia. And that makes sense too, because patients with more inflammation have had the disease for longer. And the disease starts back in the, with the choroid, choroiditis, leading to serous retinal detachment, leading then to anterior segment inflammation. So anterior segment inflammation comes after the posterior segment inflammation in this disease. There was no difference in posterior segment findings, however. Um, there was a difference that we saw in terms of sensiclo fundus, peripapillary atrophy, cataract, and need for cataract surgery being more common in patients who had thicker choroids at one week. And that makes sense as well. If anybody's interested, please look at our paper published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology in 2019 by my colleague, Dr. Makiko Nakayama, who put together our 111 cases of new onset acute VKH, which we do treat routinely with pulse intravenous corticosteroids and very successfully with a very low rate of recurrence. Now, I just want to mention posterior sclerosis because this is another great use of EDIOCT. This is a patient with new onset unilateral uh, posterior scleritis. She had pain and uh, serous retinal detachment in the left eye only. The right eye was totally normal. And you can see here that she had a thickened cord with a little bit of serous retinal detachment in that left eye uh, when she uh, presented to us. And after six months of treatment, has a more normal looking uh, choroid and uh, the serous retinal detachment resolved as well. Uh, now, this is kind of a quiz here. This patient was sent to us with recurrent posterior sclerosis and needing some kind of uh, better treatment. 33 years old. Now, you can see here that there's a little bit of anterior sclerosis as well. The right eye had a corridor thickness of 379 microns. The left eye had a thickness of 190 microns. Which eye had the recurrent scleritis? Can you all guess? Well, it turns out that it's this left eye with the thinner cori that was having recurrences of posterior scleritis, and the right eye was completely unaffected. So this eye had recurrences and had progressive atrophy of the cori. And then while we were watching him, he had another recurrence. And you can see here that from 190 microns, it went to 220 microns at the recurrence with some subretinal fluid. And after three years on steroids and methotrexate, we got him back down without any uh, fluid and no recurrences, but a thinner choroid, which also makes sense because this patient was having uh, recurrences in that left eye only. Now you might wanna ask, why is the choroid thickening when the inflammation is, is in the sclera? But as in all uveitis, you have uh, inflammation that uh, spreads to the, uh, the structures that are nearby. And, and I believe that's part of the reason why there was some corridor inflammation as well. And this is my group here, and I want to uh, thank them all for always helping me with uh, the clinics and all our research. And I'd like to thank the audience for listening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. And with this, now I would like to invite Manfred to take up the discussion and controversies. Well, first, thanks so much. Wonderful talks. I enjoyed them a lot. I hope the uh, participants too. And I would suggest due to the time uh, restrictions that we skip Mark's uh, macular, plant macular uh, talk. Mark, that's okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. I think uh, having controversies yeah. is important. So let's, let's yeah, skip it I think back it's, later. It tells a little bit what we are discussing oh. as experts, mm -hmm. what's going on. So um, one problem I have when I'm probably not too much involved in a very, very new patient, when I only look into the patient is, is this still penuveitis or is it endophthalmitis? What is your procedure to decide these things? Are there, is there any help from your side? Any ideas? 
Well, maybe I'll start. Um, I think it depends when we're talking about an infection, an endophthalmitis, is it post-surgical, is it post-traumatic, or is it endogenous? In the first two, there's usually pain associated and there's the history that helps. And it's usually very acute. And, um, and you, 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 it, it's a, a very inflamed looking eye. And very often I look for the presence of some degree of hypopion. If it's endogenous and it's affecting just the retina, and here we can think of both uh, fungal infections, which usually are not associated with pain, but a typical picture, or an infiltrate at the back of the eye with a lot of vasculitis associated, these are usually debilitated patients, so then the history is useful. Um, and there's usually very little pain associated. So the, the appearance of an of a expanding type of granuloma or what looks like an infiltrate that is getting into the vitreous will make me think more of an infection than a, an inflammatory mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with Mark. In addition to the signs, pain, chemosis, lididema, what is also important is the glow. Uveitis might be very severe, but it never produces yellow glow. If you see yellow glow in a patient in such a scenario, goes more in favor of endophthalmitis than pan uveitis. But I think, Manfred, you were asking about chronic stage. I don't know. I, I honestly did not get your question. You said well, I think the acute situation is uh, one which is the most curious because that's something you see, you met the patient very quickly and you have to decide very quickly what to do. I think we all know that there are some types of endophthalmitis where you really have to to, to work, to do something very quickly. Otherwise, you know, patients I, have lost things. I just love to go in, take out whatever is there and do a diagnostic. So if you are in doubt and you are really caught in a situation where you don't know what it is, I think best is to go in, get the samples out and sort out, rather than waiting indefinitely for doing the testing and conservative. That's how I would do it. Mm -hmm. Fernando is a surgeon. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, yes, <laughs> Vishali knows me well, but um, I agree with Mark and Vishali. Definitely um, the history is very important. And we know from studies that not all patients present with all the, with all the characteristics that we are used to seeing in ophthalmitis. And patients may not have hypopion, may not have pain, may not have uh, certain other things, and 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 it may not look like a typical endophthalmitis, but depending on the history, if you have any doubt, please do a tap and inject, and uh, and go from there, and and get a a, a response, uh, an answer from from the culture. Would you also Can agree that? Yes. Sorry, would you also agree that pain in a penuveitis patient without massive glaucoma with high pressure is a very classical sign uh, of end, uh, endophthalmitis and absolutely atypical for any type of uveitis. I think the pain would be panophthalmitis. It wouldn't just be an endophthalmitis, but really a panophthalmitis then, yeah. Well, some types yeah. of, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Pain is a good distinguisher. I just want to pipe in um, because Fernando works in the United States and we are starting to inject brolucizumab as well here in Japan. You know, that uh, question of is it, you know, inflammation or is it infection? It really becomes uh, important after some of these uh, patients that were injecting with brolucizumab. And uh, my colleague had a patient with uh after brolucizumab injection, about three weeks after, who had hypopion, uh, very, very uh, bad inflammation and a little bit of retinal vasculitis in the back. So, you know, the question is, uh, is this just uh, a, an inflammatory reaction, uh, an adverse effect of brolucizumab with the hypopion? Uh, and um, the patient was treated as a non-infectious uh, adverse event and uh, recovered, did fine, uh, basically with the topical and uh, periocular injection of steroid. So, and I mean, that's a very typical case for brolucizumab because we know we are expecting a non-infective inflammation there. But 
if it was brolicizumab or venibizumab, you would think more in terms of infection because that's not what you expect. So I think as Mark said in the beginning, the context is very important, the scenario. Right. That, you know? I think, you know, even in this context, Annabelle, if, if somebody had a doubt that it was infectious and treated it as an infectious, that would be perfectly okay. I think mm -hmm. if you suspect infection, you should really be aggressive, do what Vishal had said, get some samples and treat it. You know, in the worst case scenario, you're just going to find that it was inflammatory and uh, that's the end of story. The infection right. will progress quickly, which is the other factor we didn't talk about is infection progresses and it doesn't, you know, within a day, a bad infection can blind an eye. Right. In, in um, fact, in the United States, because of many of the medical legal issues that we have, uh, if you have a patient where you don't know if it is infectious or non-infectious, you have to tap and inject to, to make sure you ruled out that possibility. Uh, and even though you think, okay, this may be an, an sterile inflammation from rolizizumab, but, but if you're not sure, many of the cases that have been reported that have been tapped and inject just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, you can also have the same adverse reaction after a flibercept and after ranibizumab. It's just that the, the rate is so much different. Uh, and of course, we can also be causing infectious endophthalmitis in these patients too. So it's a, it's a tough call sometimes. Can I add probably one more question to endophthalmitis and OCT? Is it helpful to do OCT to differentiate to uveitis? Are there types of endophthalmitis where you find very typical signs in OCT, which you do not find in uveitic situations? A very typical sign with the endogenous variety is the rain cloud sign. Like you see the thing coming from the choroid involving the full thickness of the retina and just breaking through into the vitreous. So if you see the cells breaking into the vitreous, that's a very classically endophthalmitis because no amount of retinitis, howsoever severe, will have a breakthrough. Like cells in the vitreous, but not the breakthrough. So that's the rain cloud mm -hmm. sign. Like in candida? Like in candida. I agree with that. Because mm. I had a patient, I thought it was dengue foveolitis because it was showing such a beautiful foveolitis, like so it shows. And 72 hours later, it started that cells, you know, flipping out of mm -hmm. the retina into the vitreous. So that was candida, actually. So can I add probably one more point? Um, I think we as a specialist, we are working with these things for a lot of people which once in a while see uveitis patients, they always try to put everything into these patients in and they do not know how to work with signs which are missing for the diagnosis. So I think we are aware this belongs to the disease and this does not belong to the disease. I think that's a very important point. So what we are missing, for example, these uh, white dot syndromes, a lot of these white dot syndromes hardly have any vitreous cells. That tends to a real difference to, let's say, sarcoidosis, toxoplasmosis, or something like that. Then I think something which I've learned from our Turkish friends uh, is that snowballs never, ever happen in Bechet's disease. I think that's a good point to work with these things. Yes, you really can hardly, uh, you easily can exclude disorders. We are working with Fuchs uveitis, with Synechia, something like that, but they do not exist. If they exist, it's different disease. Um, what about snowballs and then developing, adding some chor choroidal inflammation or even retinal inflammation? I think this is also something which points in very, very clear directions. This is not something normal. So you hardly have a development of intermediate uveitis with snowballs into penuveitis. I think you would agree with some very, very limited uh, differences. TB, I guess, and sarcoidosis. And our good old friend, vitreoretinal lymphoma. So I think that's a major point for people which are probably not working too much in uveitis to be aware of these things. Would you add something else to these things? Uh, snowballs, yeah, snowballs and 
developing of posterior viitis. Any other ideas? No, I, I, I agree. It's... I agree with the differential diagnosis once they develop into posterior uveitis. And I think that guide us and get, get the proper imaging and testing, uh, which is what we're trying to do with this basic course to uh, uh, teach people that uh, based on the clinical findings, you tailor the, the lab test that you're going to need to do for uh, making the proper diagnosis. You just don't you know, throw a, a battery of tests on, a, on every patient. You, you just tailor what you need. And, and this, you know, the very, very fine, elegant details uh, teach people how to make very good diagnoses that are difficult. I think Mark gave a very clear uh, information in that regard. Think about first, have a look, and then depending what you see, then go into the uh, diagnostics. I think the time to uh, ruin your business with diagnostics, that's super old fashioned, yes? We don't ruin anyone, definitely not. It's very, very limited diagnostics, which we do. So even in my talks in, let's say, in Africa, where they have really restricted uh, possibilities, go on with these things, a lot of these things is clinical. And we discussed a lot of clinical things today. And depending from the clinics, we go on to some kind of diagnostics. And I think that should be the way to learn about uveitis and that's what we want to transfer here with our, our webinars. Any comments from your side? I think we are close to four o'clock. Well, our time nearly finished. Any comments? No, I just wanna... have... yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Anna, I... no? I just wanted to second what Manfred is saying. You know, so much of uveitis is, is pattern recognition. And, you know, it's really hard to condense it into these webinars and courses. And it really takes years of doing uveitis to recognize those patterns. But once you see one, see, see it once, you'll, you'll never forget it. And, and that's what I uh, remember uh, from, you know, very rare stuff that I saw when I was a resident that I ended up seeing again, one case in Japan, you know, 20 years later, and I, it just popped out of my brain uh, mm. somewhere in, in the, you know, the memory banks. So uh, it, it's tough to, to teach, but, you know, just it, try to experience as many cases as you can, because uh, these rare cases, they do come once in a while. And go ahead, Mark, I'm sorry to have interrupted no, you. No, I think I, I, I second what you say. I think, you know, we always think about zebras, but most of the time, you know, if you have hoof beats, you have to think more of horses. And the zebras are usually because there's something odd. You know, you see some snowballs, but there's nothing else going on. There's no inflammation. The patient's okay. And then you see a stri uh, some strings appearing, and maybe you have amyloidosis. But those cases are very rare. And I think the other thing to go on to what, what you said, Annabelle, if you don't have access to local specialists that can help you to um, make a diagnosis, then, you know, we have on the IUSG website a, uh, a way for you to send in some of your very complex cases to get advice from the specialists that you've seen here and many others uh, around the world that can help you. And I think, you know, that's a good service to get you started and sort of maybe prevent you from feeling that you're all alone to deal with uveitis. Manfred? Yeah, that's a very nice one. Thanks. And I really, there were two questions about this one uh, from the participants uh, regarding our website. They didn't find some kind of our services. The so one is internships. We have a whole list of all the members. Okay, not with their email contacts, please. Yes, but with the city and the country they are living in. And if you go to the uh, ISG website, and then to the members, you should find the education list. I think you find it. If not, send me a WhatsApp, a email. And if you cannot find my email, go send it to the secretaries from the ISG and I will comment to this one. The same is um, one of the question was there was some, they asked for some help. Um, you should find it actually on the top line uh, of the ISG help. And this works now very nicely. And uh, we will do our best to help you for even the more complicated cases. 
Okay, so in that regard, if there's nothing else to comment, thanks so much for wonderful presentations. Probably one more word, sorry, one more word. This was a basic course and we wanted to tell you not about each entity of posterior viitis. This will take probably all the planned 36 courses. We want to give you some clinical signs, what you have to look for to go on from this one to more into details. So don't get frustrated that we did not talk too much about the special entities, disorders. That was not the plan of the day. That was an introduction leading you probably to some more clear disorders, which we will cover in some of the next webinars. Thanks so much to all of you. Happy Eastern, whoever is celebrating this one. And I think the next webinar will be begin of May. Thanks very much, okay, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Nice thank seeing everybody everyone. again. Take nice care. Nice everyone to take care. You too. Bye. Stay well. Yep, yeah, you too. Uh, should we go quickly through the questions? Questions. Where are they? Oh, they have shut down everything. I've been answering no. many yes. questions. I've answered yeah, about six of them. Here, so, wow. Um, Okay, I'll be leaving you guys. I need to get onto another call. So enjoy your weekend. And I'm jealous of all your Zai Zakura there, Annabelle. Oh, this was just from last week. It's beautiful. I know. Thanks, I remember Mark. I saw it once. I saw it once years ago in Kihanto, and I have such a good memory of it. It's oh. something quite unique. And of Please course, in come. Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same Sakura too there <laughs> from Japan. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, Look forward to seeing everyone again in person sometime, but everyone stay safe and well. Yeah, you too. Have you been Thanks. vaccinated yet? I just got my first uh, Pfizer injection last week. Well, you're lucky. Uh, you yeah. know that here, here in the canton where I'm living, they're saying that physicians working in a private office just have to wait until the regular population gets uh, vaccinated. Are you cannot you know, believe I, that. And I see patients, you know, that are immunosuppressed, elderly patients. And last week I had one of my patients that came along and he said, you know, doc, I didn't want to tell you, but last November, the day after I saw you, I was admitted to hospital with COVID. Oh said, my goodness. Why didn't you call me? Well, you take so many measures. And if I had called you, you would have had to close down for two weeks. And I said, but I could have infected a hell of a lot of people. Yeah. So, you know, I don't understand oh my goodness. Policy and I'm trying to get them to reverse it, but I'm waiting and we'll see what happens. Anyhow, wow. thank you, Vishali. You did a great job as usual.
Vishali, I would like to see your OCT images on that um, breakthrough from the retina into the vitreous someday. Yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, it's true. You see that. And, um, I... Yeah, okay, I'd love good. to see that. Okay, everyone take okay. care. I'm going to sign uh, off too. Yeah, right. Okay, all the best. Bye. Okay, I'm gonna go to sleep, guys. So thanks, Manfred. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks very much for a lovely and Fernando's talk. Fernando's gone already. Okay, take care. Good night. Good night. So who's left? Vishali? Yeah. Can you help me with these things here? Oh yeah, I see that. So let me start on top and we'll see what still have to go on. Oh, I just answering this one, Vishali. Then we are done. Should I answer this one? Absolutely. Okay. Or VKH, do you give anything else than metotrexate? Uh, we do use MMF. And like in this patient, if there is an acute attack, you cannot give steroids for whatever reason, then sometimes biologics, very rare. You have good results in biologics with VKH? Yes. We just used in one or two patients, but MMF, we have had good results. Metotrexate, MMF, as a thioprene. Or some of the patients who cannot afford liver functions on a regular basis, um, we do give as a therapy. It works. Great session. Many thanks again. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. And looking forward. was fun. good. I think probably we need to have more time for discussion. Next one. Talks may be shorter. Such we'll a figure. big field, you know. We'll figure it out. It's such a big field, yeah. But I'm. Um, weekend, everyone, and all of those who are staying, 115 people, have a great weekend. You too. Bye. <laughs>